As Stella from Journey to Babel. Uh, my name is Laurie Dale. No, I mean you're out here. Oh, I am a Denebian slime devil. We have very large houses on Troy, especially in the upper class, which I belong to, and it's uh, takes you have to clean them by yourself. There are two classes of people. There's your monocolored, and then there's your duo-colored. I'm Ambassador X from uh, Ecosystem Four, and I just had to get here for the Star Trek convention because uh, I've been viewing it on a monitor uh, on my planet. Star Trek lives because there are a lot of people who respect good science fiction. For about three years. You know, you can't help but love them. Well, it was innovative. It was done with... Um, uh, Gene Roddenberry had a tremendous um, pension for detail. It had authenticity. It had relevance. Uh, um, even when he did a show with monsters, they were properly motivated. And it was, um, uh, in a sense, uh, it was television's version of um, 2001 Clockwork Orange and that whole genre of uh, realistic, uh, uh, not necessarily message-laden, but um, a point of view laden film. In 1966, September, Star Trek came on the air for the first time. Two weeks before the pilot was even shown, I was nudging people, look at it, look at it, because I had read this little thing in TV Guide with a picture. I said, this looks fantastic. It looks like a real science fiction TV series. And the night of the pilot, of course, I went crazy. And the day after, I started pestering my friends. We're starting a club now. We'd like to see Star Trek back on the air because it was the first serious science fiction program on television. Before that time, there were several minor kitty programs, but nothing that dealt with science fiction as it truly is. The speculative fiction, uh, thoughts about the future, thoughts that, that would incorporate a, a true uh, possible harmony for the entire world and for the entire galaxy. They speak about the mission of the Enterprise being to boldly go, a split infinitive I heard every single time, to boldly go where no man has ever gone before. They mean it primarily, I suppose, in territorially. They're visiting stars that no man has till then ever visited. They're going through vast distances no man has ever penetrated. But in addition, they're meeting problems that man has not faced. Star Trek really presented was the brotherhood of intelligence. It mattered not what form the intelligence took or what kind of universe the intelligence built for it. If it was intelligent, if it was intelligent enough to build a culture, then it had the right to live in that culture. It had the right to exist and be and no other culture had a right to interfere with it as long as it was not endangering cultures beyond itself. We try to measure our behavior according to uh, the Vulcan ideals of tolerance, if you understand what I mean. That's why I wear, this is the idiot. Infinite diversity and infinite combination. The ideal that, that we can coexist with each other, not just passively, but that the interactions of people who live differently can produce something greater than either of the two could produce by themselves. We did anti-war stories when other shows on the air could not mention Vietnam. Uh, we did um, one that was simply anti any war at all, and then one that was specifically anti-Vietnam. We did stories that simply said you have to recognize that people who aren't of your own race or color uh, are your brothers, whether you like it or not. Star Trek was, in a sense, the sanest, the most meaningful, it tackled real social problems. It was not devoted entirely to adventure. And most of all, it had fully realized characters. Uh, naturally, Spock springs to mind. The rational, sane man. And there's something very comforting about sanity, especially in a world like ours. I think it's the extreme logic of the character. It's uh, something along the lines of perhaps a future evolution of uh, mankind. I think everybody would like to be cool, would like to be able to hide their emotions because um, it makes them, I don't know, it makes them superior to be able to hide everything from a person. I thought that was rather intriguing the way they handled it. No matter how successful 
as Star Trek was with its viewers, no matter how intensely it pleased its viewers, unfortunately, the medium of television these days depends entirely upon a mass audience. They sell advertising time. That is their business. The program is merely a way of enticing you to watch the advertising. And if there isn't enough of an audience, the advertisers won't come, regardless of how intensely pleased the audience they do get is. In the case of Star Trek, these problems were encountered very early. Gene Roddenberry fought them constantly. We all supported the concept that it could be something fresh, it could be something special, it could be something different. It could be done right. It could be done meaningfully. It could be done in a way which would be entertaining to those who are looking for entertainment. It could be provocative for those who are willing to accept the provocative concepts that it presented. And in a way that would be uplifting for those who were available to that element. Uh, we are very, very proud of the fact that so many of the episodes captured so many of those important elements and that you were there to help support us to let us know that you were picking up on the things that were happening in the show. The universe it created was self-consistent, imaginative, and makes its viewers long to be part of it. And they didn't want to see it come to an end. <laughs> it's just the happiest day of my entire life. I never expected to see him. I, I, it's just so beautiful. I can't help it. <laughs>